Step outside. Yate, everyone. Thank you very much for being here this evening. This is the Wednesday evening Indigenous Ways Wisdom Circle event. And as always, we want to take this time to acknowledge the traditional owners and ancestors of the tribal lands Ogapoge Owinge, also known as Santa Fe. We reside and thank you all for blessing us. We want to take this time to offer condolences to Dr. Nolani Arista, who was originally scheduled for tonight, and her her family is um, in a process of saying their goodbyes to their father who just passed in Hawaii. So we are holding Nolani and family in our hearts. And saying that, we're also very grateful to Lucy Tampahanso, who rescheduled from December to be with us now. So if you had Lucy and just a quick intro, I'd like to tell you that uh, Lucy Tapahanso has been in the indigenous circuit of writers for uh, quite a while now. And Lucy's mother tongue is in Navajo and she learned English in boarding school on the Navajo nation. Her discovery into the English language is very unique because as an English second language learner, she has ascended to become the top of her game on the world stage with English language as her vehicle. English language is like a conduit for her to get her Navajo worldviews out in a way that takes us away from a linear structure of syntax and semantics and pragmatics and morphemes and all that stuff that comes with the English language, but she's able to convey that Navajo thought process in the Navajo cultural way, which is very sacred and matriarchal in the Navajo, also known as Diné culture's own right. So Lucy's been awarded with multiple honors, fellowships, awards, and uh, is always of service to the people for um, purposes of uh, information and uh, she maintains her sacred identity and uh, is an extremely elegant Dene matriarch. And everyone, please welcome Lucy Tapahansi to Indigenous Ways Wisdom Circle. <laughs> yeah. All right, Lucy. Oh, yeah. Let's uh, oh. let's hear about you. Why don't you tell us about your uh, life story? <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, um, I am uh, originally from Shiprock, where I lived until I went to college, and um, am now living in Santa Fe after having um, lived in Lawrence, Kansas, Albuquerque, and Tucson, Arizona. I taught at um, those three state universities, New Mexico, Kansas, and Arizona and uh, retired a few years ago after uh, 33 years. I can't believe it <laughs> that I've been, uh, that, you know, I had been in um, academia for that long. Um, I write in, I started writing in English because when I went to school, you know, we um, had to learn to write English, we had to write um, you know, the physical act of writing was in English. So I associated writing with English rather than Navajo, even though I could, um, you know, I, I could sort of probably translate things into Navajo, uh, I mean, into from Navajo into English uh, quite easily. But the writing for me, even today, is very much a physical 
Act. Um, we used to write on um, big chief tablets. I don't know people remember that. And then we had like these thick yellow pencils. And I really like the sound of the pencil on the page. And so today I journal every day and I just love the sound, still love that sound. Um, and um, when I learned to read, it was really kind of a freeing experience for me because I was lonely when I went to boarding school. I, you know, I grew up with a lot, a lot of my family and I have a lot of sisters and brothers and we grew up as many families do in a pretty small home by today's standards. But I was so used to being with them all the time that when I went to school, it was very, I was really lonely. Um, I miss all the noise and the cooking and everything. Um, but when I learned to read, that was kind of a salvation for me because I could go to the library and check out books and read. And then I used to, um, there was no, of course, no books that had Navajos in it or that even mentioned Shiprock. <laughs> so I used to um, uh, copy books, but then put place the stories at home, make the settings in Shiprock or around the res, and then put my dogs in and my sisters and brothers. So I would sure rewrite all the stories so they may, they were more appealing to me. Um, little that I know, did I know I was plagiarizing, but that was a long time ago. So, <laughs> so, um, so when I went to college, I began to I was in journalism because I always liked writing. Then I took a class from Leslie Silco in poetry. It was an elective. And then after that, I was hooked. I was like, um, this is what I'm going to, this is what I'm going to do. Um, I was so surprised too that she liked, she was really happy about my work. I want to just show you, this. Is, uh, these were two, of the first poems I wrote in her class. And this kind of shows you like how I was, I was using a Navajo syntax, but writing in English. I was translating from Navajo into English. So you sort of see that uh, the structure is a little different. This poem's real popular because it was about uh, Shiaj, um, my, my, um, my mother's brother. We used to call him Shida'ayaj, um, but we were always so happy when we saw him. And later on, I realized that he was really my Yaj, that my, he was my brother's Dai. But we all ran to him at the same time and we would say, Shida'ayaj, Shida'ayaj. <laughs> so anyway, this is about him. It's called Hills Brothers Coffee. My uncle is a small man. In Navajo, we call him Shida'ayaj, my mother's brother. He doesn't know English, but his name in the white way is Tom Jim. He lives about a mile or so down the road from our house. One morning, he sat in the kitchen drinking coffee. I just came over, he said. The store is where I'm going to. He tells me about how my mother seems to be gone every time he comes over. Maybe she sees me coming, then runs and jumps in her car and speeds away, he says, smiling. We both laugh just to think of my mother jumping in her car and speeding. I pour him more coffee and he spoons in sugar and cream until it looks almost like a chocolate shake. Then he sees the coffee can. Oh, that's that coffee with the man in a dress, like a church man. Oh, that's the one that does it for me. Very good coffee. I sit down again and he tells me, some coffee has no kick. But this one is the one. It does it good for me. I pour us both a cup. And while we wait for my mother, his eyes crinkle with a smile. And he says, yes, ah, oh, yes, this is the very one. 
putting in more sugar and cream. So I usually buy Hills Brothers coffee once or sometimes twice a day. I drink a hot coffee and it sure does it for me. <laughs> That's a good one. Thank oh, you. <laughs> thank you so much. So, so uh, tell us about writing in Navajo and English and how one informs other, the other and what do they bring to each other? And uh, you mentioned that uh, your process, um, how does it work when you're working with, um, like I imagine sometimes you have a Navajo audience like if you're mm -hmm. doing something on the reservation and you have mm -hmm. Navajo speaking audience, so you can really talk in Navajo with all the vernaculars and dialect and all that. And then when you're away from the ESL Navajo audience, meaning uh, English second language learners, mm -hmm. um, and you go into another uh, country where they're also ESL, because obviously English has pretty much almost taken Standard. really almost conquered the world mm -hmm. um does it feel different what does it feel differently when you're with navajo people and when you're with other esl audiences i think it does you know when i'm reading to a primarily navajo audience they really have a sense already of what i'm talking about so you know like if i tell them that this is a poem translated from navajo uh, the part they know that where my uh, the part where I say um, uh, my uncle says I just came over the stories where I'm going to he says he said oh he said can go to ya you know mm -hmm. I'm just I'm like I'm just kind of going by or you know mm -hmm. so they un I think people pick up on that but there's so much that uh, kind of nuances in the way Navajos talk English that it's uh it becomes obvious too because um uh they understand that hills brothers coffee is, is has a particular picture and they know what the translation means when he says the man uh uh the man from the church um etna shorty you know the catholics and on the coffee he has an Arabian man like this with his long robes. So he thought it was the Catholic's coffee. So Navajo people kind of understand, you know, it's like the inside joke. They know uh -huh. that. Um, and, um, but then it's like, the, it, when we talk English as Navajos, it's really specific and very precise, very vivid. So, um, you know, people just say what, whatever they were going to say in English, it's really clear and it's crisp and to the point. Right. So, um, yeah, so I think it's a little different, but then wherever I travel, there's always people that are indigenous to the land that I'm visiting and they understand like the, um, the origins of the language that I speak English, but it's probably the kind of, in a way, similar to the English they speak. So, you know, and, and it really speaks to, I think, indigenous people all over all the places I've been. Um, they understand the land and the relationships between people, the dogs and the food cooking and, you know, getting together. So there's some mm -hmm. things that are that cross language barriers and, you know, just are able to really bring us together. Um, I want to read the other poem that I mentioned and this one's called Raisin Eyes and it's written that in that same, in that same time frame. And these two points were the first ones that uh, were published. This is called Raisin Eyes. And if you're, you're from the res, you'll recognize a lot of uh, places and things here. Yeah. I saw my friend Ella at, with a tall cowboy at the store the other day in Shiprock. Later, I asked her, who's that guy anyway? Oh, Lucy, she said, I knew what was coming. It's terrible. He lives with me. 
and my money and my car. But just for a while, he's an AI RCA and rodeos a lot. And I still work. This rodeo business is getting to me, you know. And I'm going to leave him because I think all of this I'm doing now will pay off better somewhere else. But I just stay with him. And it's hard because he just smiles that way, you know. And then I end up paying entry fees and putting shiny Tony, Tony Llamas on layaway again. It's not hard. But he doesn't know when I'll leave him and I'll drive across the flat desert from Red Valley and blue morning light straight to Shiprock so easily. And anyway, my car is already used to humming a morning song with Gary Stewart complaining again of aching and breaking down and out love affairs. Damn, these Navajo cowboys with raisin eyes and pointed boots are just bad news. But it's so hard to remember that all the time, she said with a little laugh. <laughs> oh, that is too cool. That is so, that is so Navajo. I mean, I'm just like thinking about my aunties. I'm like, are any of my aunties here tonight? <laughs> anyway, so I'm thinking about my uncle. They come from a rodeo family too. So, uh, but but one, that that is just so uh, right spot on, you know, that Red Valley and Ship Rock and and driving it's always like yeah it's just that the, that road you've been dri driving out of ship rock so yeah nice and then when you were talking about the the navajo language and english i was thinking about you um meeting with one of the our navajo elders on the reservation and you're showing your poetry but they can't understand the english so you have to say you know I'm going to interpret this for you. This I wrote oh. this in English, and then you say, like, you know, I'm thinking about the Etna Shorty, and oh. you know, thinking about the Etna Shorty is like clothes that you think of a, almost like this this cloak um, cape that a priest wears, and you can just uh -huh. see them moving. You can almost <laughs> see wind, you know, just Etna Shorty, you know, the priest cruising to the uh -huh. church, and if there's so much uh, verbiage in the Navajo language that the English is missing out on. So mm -hmm. even if you're talking about riding on a horse in English, you can put all these different nuances to it. But in the Navajo, you're actually on the horse. If you're listening <laughs> to it. And it's it's so really true. Sometimes yeah. when I, uh, one of the examples I use um, when I'm uh, talking about poetry and how succinct it is, is uh, an, an example from Navajo, you know, a person can say, and you know that just from that, not even later, just the horse, there's somebody on a horse, they're almost parallel to the ground. They're going real fast. And whoever it is is leaning over. It has to be outside because they can't go that fast indoors. And it has yeah. to be like flat ground. You can kind yeah. of see the dust in that. Sleep yeah. that's a ticket. They're both going, you know, they're just, yeah. just going to and that's just the image by itself. And think sleep with that's a ticket, four, four syllables. And you mm -hmm. can imagine all that. So that's an example of how Navajo is just like so visual and emotional. And you it tells you where things are taking place without yeah. you saying, oh, the lady. Oh, yeah, that, infl that inflection right there, lady. It's like, just go, <laughs> when you do that, it goes like, wait. Oh, no, what's no, up? No, what's <laughs> up? Yeah. What's you know, up? All, that's all that, you know, that inflection, you know, and mm -hmm. it's really interesting because uh, like with sign language, you know, our, <laughs> our brother here, Chris, 
Um, he's one of the masters of the language and and uh, he can put all that on his face with the non-manual signals, <laughs> the inflections. No, you know, it's just like, it's just, it's just so it's, amazing. You to know, do. it really is. So we come from a language that's so rich, that's yeah. both original and always changing. You know, it's just, it's just really quite amazing. Oh, oh, so these uh, poems, if I could, I, these poems are like right from Navajo experience. I want to read a poem that's in fixed form, which means it's a Western form that was invented centuries ago. This is a poem that's called Sestina and it's French. It yeah. is the song of sixes. It has six stanzas. It uses six, six same words at the end of each line. And then uh, it has six stanzas, six lines in each stanza, and it ends with a tercet or an envoy, which is three lines at the end. It has three of the words in the middle of the lines and three in the, of the words at the end of the lines. So um, I'll just read this and you can sort of see where the, how the pattern fits really well for Navajo story. Oh, nice. Okay, I can't wait. It's, it's a French form, so uh -huh. a sustina. This is called Addendum to the Canon. It speaks uh -huh. very, uh, very much to the when I was the time when I was a teenager. American literature would not be complete without a chat without a chapter on stomp dances featuring the Fenders or the Wingate Valley Boys. Life in the 1960s and 70s revolved around chapter house dances at Tohachi, Tisnasbas, or Chinli. We were shy res teenagers, but when dance posters appeared, the dull school week took on a frenzy, sense unrivaled. My sisters and I streaked under our breaths at the announcements on KNDN, the all Navajo, all the time station. Call of the wild, my mom pronounced her only English words that day. The dance was a glimmer of hope in that chapter of lowly adolescence. By midweek, we were in a quiet plodding frenzy, breaking up coal, eagerly washing dishes, chopping firewood, all family building tasks. We secured a trustworthy ride to ease parental hesitation. After a unified and dignified request, our parents said la'a -uh, to the dance. But only if we promised to stay together and not tease or dance with clan relatives. Yee, yeah, they warned, pronouncing certain doom. We nodded in unison, being familiar with the reservation mandates. That evening, we waited in a state of rapture at the crossroad junction for what seemed like a lifetime for a cousin who agreed to drive us after our frenzied begging. We settled on press wranglers and rough out boots after a frenzy of trying on clothes. But now as the sun set, things did not look well. The dance began and no ride in sight. All oh, that planning and work. Now surely life as we knew it would be over if we were seen standing alongside the road as of to announce the non-existent ride. But we couldn't go home after everything. This unforeseen chapter forced us to think hard, then take the road less travel, the irrigation ditch. The rest of the now off-told tale allows as to how the carefully coughed, scared, res desperado set out in the dark ditch of burnt weeds, dead brush, and cockleburs. The frenzy, weary, aquanet escapees were fiercely intent on getting to the chapter house four miles away. Upon hearing the muffled drums and steel 
Qatars, we pranced out of the ditch and stepped warily into the streetlight, as if to renounce our sins. We dust the soot off, smooth each other's hair, relieved to be alive for another Valley Boys dance. Then, just like that, life's good fortune dimmed when we discovered we had no money. We argued res style, scolding, pushing, blaming each other in loud whispers. Then they announced that I, as the youngest, had to borrow the money. Just as I began a fuming frenzy, we spotted that cute Yazi guy. They pushed me forth to dance wordwise with him. He donated $20 and we entered the dim chapter house. The dance floor was rife with cowboys hats circling, cowboy hats circling. Then, alas, my uncle appeared. His eyes announced our peril. We left in distraught single file, weak from hairspray, fatigue, and burnt weeds. He seated us to our mom and aunties. It's still unbearable to recall the next week of field work, chopping wood, and just work, work, work. Oh, wow. That's so beautiful. Oh, wow. So, Thank you. <laughs> so poetry is just such a dignified packing of words and every line has uh, a full throttle image of just, just one line and one stanza mm -hmm. carries so much power with, you know, uh, a mixture of abstractions and real life you know, figures. And there's so many questions I have for you about your working relationship you have with writing. You say you write and you journal and your childhood memory is that that sound on the paper with the, the, mm. the, 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 the what is it? The, what do you call that? The pencil? Pencil on like, yeah, pencil on paper. Yeah, I mean, just just that in itself is a poem. You know, and you can just write a poem with that in itself. And mm -hmm. I'm really curious about how you, I know you said you took a class. Did you say with Leslie Marmon Soko? Uh -huh. uh -huh. You took a class with her. And then um, did the poetry, poetry just jump out at you? Or did you hear it, study it, and learn some of the different styles and techniques? And, they, and then say, I want to give a go at that. And my most, um, fixated curiosity is about the Navajo language, mm -hmm. about the Navajo language in it all, because um, just to be able to think in Navajo and to put it into poetry, even like you did with that last piece you wrote. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk <laughs> to us people out here that maybe want to learn how to write poetry? How do you do it? How do you do it? <laughs> well, you know, um, I grew up in a household um, which we had radio but we didn't have tv and um we didn't have electricity until maybe i was in you know junior high or something so and there was a lot of us and we had always had relatives living with us so there was a lot of intergenerational you know things going on cooking together eating together you know taking care of the babies and trying to break up fights between siblings and all kinds of things. So it was a very, you know, just a really active household. But then um, my parents um, really instilled in us like that we should respect when an older person is talking. They would say, and that meant we we would all listen and we all quiet it down and listen. And when he when uh if it was my mother or my father, they would always tell us things, uh, but then in a voice that wasn't scolding, but that was really informational. We could tell by their tone that we had to listen. And um, so there was a lot of that kind of uh 
probably encouragement to listen and then to tell stories, to remember, and then to, to sh they, they would say, listen to this because when your little brother or sister's your age, you're gonna to have to tell them that. So we really had, there was very much emphasis on respect and remembering and listening, uh, whether it was songs or prayers or stories. And then we didn't have a radio in our car. We had, we had one pickup and uh, my father used to sing Navajo songs whenever we went places. Um, we would be working out in the fields and my mother would start telling stories. And it was just yeah. like a way for us to, to concentrate on what we're doing, but also to like value each other's company. So it was really like a st uh, steeped in oral tradition. And, mm. um, and then when I was in, probably when I was in junior high, I started keeping a journal and I've kept a journal since. I just liked writing and I went into journalism um, and I used to write for different newspapers and that sort of thing. But when I found poetry, I used to write poetry, but when I after I took that class, that's when I kind of, and Leslie really encouraged me. I was really shy and I was so embarrassed. I used to, when I read my poems, I would just be shaken. <laughs> you had to read your poems in class. And well, I felt like I was going to cry. And, um, but she very much encouraged me. And then, so that was like a, really an impetus to mm -hmm. delve into it more. And then also to study it because I had a, a good basic understanding of Navajo oral literature, but I didn't really know that much about Western form. And I really wanted to learn, you know, so I was really interested in learning about the history and then about how different forms came about. And it turned out that, you know, even in Western literature, the beginning of poetry were people who went around to different villages in Europe and told stories they will get called to come up to, you know, by the, the head of a town to come and talk to the people. And they were really valued for that. They weren't, you know, wasn't later that they were written down. So it was, you know, the history too in Europe was very much all over, I think was really uh, originated with stories and memory and then the ties to the land. So, um, so then I began to really, you know, look into and I appreciate um, all kinds of written literature. And uh, then eventually after, you know, I, I finished college, um, I began to teach. And at that point I was um, probably the only teacher, a lot of people, a lot of students, um, had who was Navajo mm. and um it was uh so it was I was you know in a position to uh teach um from a Navajo point of view so that meant oh. that you know I I taught them about um the adage that the sacred begins at the tip of my tongue so whatever a person says is sacred. And so we don't have words in Navajo that are words of profanity. Mm -hmm. And then we also don't, uh, uh, like you can't, you know, I don't think you can really say that you're sorry. So mm -hmm. words, the spoken word is so important in our, in our history, in our culture. Um, and it's all related to, you know, Hoshonche. And people really, uh, people really uh, respect that. And um, so, you know, that's why like Hatakasis mm -hmm. and storytellers are really valued because everything they share with us is what they have remembered and what they know, not what they have learned in books. So there's still that, you know, I think there's still that respect for, a lot of respect for, um, and doing ceremonies and 
we saw that just this past weekend, you know, with the eclipse, that a lot of people did observe the eclipse the way that we're supposed to. And uh, so, you know, I, I think it's really important that it all, it all relates to um, the idea of um, Hujonje. Oh, and can you uh, take this time to um, explain to the people that might not be familiar with uh, Hojonje and just uh, explain the, the basic meaning of Hojonje? Mm -hmm. Hojon. Um, there's different ways of talking about it. Um, one of them is that, uh, so Hojon um, is, uh, it, a lot of people translate it to beauty, but I think it's more to balance, like to have everything balanced out. Everything can't be good all the time. There's always a balance of good and bad. The way you approach it is what counts. That's called, that's when you can look at things and figure out what's what you're going to do without being impulsive and overreacting. So I like to tell people that um, that when people say yate, it doesn't mean just hello or hi, uh, that yate is part of yada or joane, our father, the sun. So it's like acknowledging the, the sky and the sun. And then ah is like na san, our mother earth where we're at on this land, we're supported by our, our mother, the earth. And um, uh, she supports us and she comforts us. She strengthens us and feeds us. Um, wherever we go, we're always supported by her and we grow skyward towards our father. And we're known as um, mid, um, earth surface people um so we are um we exist here on this earth with our father above us and we're supported by our mother and then when they say eh, that means the, that's the way it is it's beautiful because we have our father above our mother we're right in the middle and they will always care for us they have cared for us from the beginning and they'll continue to care for us and our children and our grandchildren so we go forth then remembering that and thinking about what those uh what they embody what those entities embody and you know we have to breathe and we have to have water and they make sure we have all those things and it's our job to go forward in in a way that uh honors that so that's i think you know to me that's what they mean when they say i'm going forth in a very good way in front of me behind me below me above me uh, i'm surrounded by very good spirits a very good uh way of thinking that um I, I I can't forget it and that it guides me all the time. So. Wow, that is just the medicine we need at this time, Lucy. Oh, yeah. oh, thank you for sharing thank that. You. Um, there's so much happening right now and it's heavy. It's heavy on everybody's oh. heart and mm -hmm. Uh, it's oh. difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, so you coming on to our show tonight is blessing all of us with your medicine, your beautiful walk and you. your beautiful energy, your essence, your aura. And, you know, I have so much to ask you. I was really curious about how your perspective is about how our youth is taken to this. Nobody goes anywhere without this anymore. <laughs> And how does that impact the spoken word? How does that impact the attention span of when we would sit around on the floor in the Hogan and just listen to our Masanis and Chase tell mm. their stories and we'll just get mm. lost in the stories. And, but let's do that for another chapter. The last question I want to ask you, and then I'm going to do a commercial break and Elena will tell us what's going on with Indigenous Ways is, 
What does the word gathering mean to you? That's our theme. You know, a gathering is really uh, like at the crux of, I think everything we do is Navajos. Uh, we had a Kinalta for my, my granddaughter over the summer and um, a medicine woman I was talking to told me that Kinalta means the community coming together. Kin, you know, it's like a town. Nalta, they all come together. And you, when you run, then you know, uh, you walk. I mean, it's it, Nalta really implies moving about together as a community. And in everything we do, you know, when we have a first laugh party for a dinner for a baby, you invite everybody you can that will be that you know so that uh, the more people you have and the more food and the, the more blessings you get, but the more people that are there means that the baby will never be lonely. The mm. baby will always have relatives and that the baby will always be generous and that there'll always be like humor, you know, because of celebrating a laugh. Mm. Um, and so, uh, and the same with the, like the kinata. If 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 you're blessed to have a lot of people come and help you out and be there for you, you know what more could you ask for? There's so much love in that. When you have uh, any kind of a gathering, like when somebody goes off to college, when somebody takes a new job or when they move, you know, everyone, they say, let's eat for them because yeah. they're going to be moving. And yeah. but eating for them, it really means let's bless them. Let's let them know that we're here, that we're going to be thinking about them. And sure enough, at those times, people always stand up and talk, you know, and mm -hmm. to talk means to like, to express your love, to give comfort, to offer your strength. The whole group, not just yourself. So I think yeah, that's what gathering means to me. We're always wow. like moving from one, one group of people to another. <laughs> oh, you're making me homesick for Jishin oh. Jean. So, um, <laughs> I've got relatives at Jishin Sado, Jishin Jean. So oh. um, my mom's in Chinle. She should be on tonight. My aunt should oh. be So I'm going to pass it over to Elena. All right, thank you. Hey, hey, Lucy Tapahanzo, mm -hmm. and blessing us with your beautiful medicine, your words. Uh, just hit deeply for me. Thank you, thank you, oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh. And, uh, you know, the laughter medicine as well with your wonderful pieces. And I am very, very excited because I'm going to be heading home to Aotearoa, New Zealand uh, oh. at the end of November. So as you were talking about your siblings and Rare's life and growing up, and I just cannot wait to uh, see my aunties, uncles, dad. <laughs> I'm going over, we're going over to Samoa and seeing my mother and also spending some time in Australia as well for the next very two months. Nice. So very, very It'll exciting. be nice and warm there. <laughs> <laughs> totally. That's another great reason. Ditch <laughs> the winter. <laughs> so thank you so much for that beautiful, beautiful medicine that you shared with us. I'm just going to go into a quick commercial break with what's uh, been going on. Uh, our in the next uh, month, we have the beautiful Jean Brave Rock, who is a Canadian actor who will be here this time, third Wednesday of the month, uh, six to seven mountain time. That's the 15th of November. Uh, Jean is uh, an actor and you may have seen him uh, in Dark Winds as the actor Frank Nakai. Uh, he's also played the role of Chief in Wonder Woman, which was released in 2007. So he's going to be blessing us here. Uh, we'll be doing this again, and you may have some Q&A afterwards, like when I finish this. 
we're going to encourage everyone to come on uh, if you've got any uh, questions or just want to say hi or anything like that. Now, this wonderful video archive of Lucy Tapahanzo will be available in our archives, indigenousways.org. She will be there available in the next 24 hours with the over 200 uh, presenters that we've had, Native American, Indigenous, LGBTQIA2+, our deaf and hard of presenters that have come through since April 2020 when we started this and keeping our communities connected. So you can go there and have a look. When Lucy Tapahanzo's beautiful video uh, comes out, please share that with all of your peeps. You can also describe, subscribe at our website on the homepage, indigenousways.org, to our newsletter so you know what's going on. We've just finished our 2020, 2023 season of having the festival um, season, which was a lot of fun. Uh, so we'll be doing that again in 2024. Below me, you'll see flashing across the screen all of our social media so if you're beaming in through social media, please like our pages wherever you're on. You'll notice that there's new URLs or new handles. Uh, we are transferring from the Indigenous Ways 501c3 to just Indigenous Ways. So that's what we've got going on below. We'd love to see you there. Pop in and subscribe and say hi. And also tonight, you would have seen our two extraordinary ASL interpreters. Right now, we have the beautiful mm -hmm. Crisesiano Garcia beaming in from California, who's blessed us making access available to all, as well as the beautiful uh, Mariah Garcia, no, not related, uh, who has made interpreting accessible. We've done this from our very first show, April 1st, 2020. Now, all of these shows that we've done, the Indigenous Ways Circle, we were also doing the Indigenous Ways Concert Series, was possible thanks to the National Endowments of the Arts, the City of Santa Fe Arts and Culture Department, the Santa Fe Community Foundation, the, that's the Envision Fund, and also the New Mexico Arts. We want to give a big shout out to our board members, Rachel Pueblo, who was on social media and popped on here, Homer Hubble, also Judy Shapiro that is here, and also to all of our individual donors that have been investing in our programs, making all of this possible. Thank you. If you're able to donate, we've got PayPal, there's Venmo, there's snail mail uh, with the address here, or you can go to our website, indigenousways.org. Uh, keep this habit going and spotlighting extraordinary presenters, people like Lucy Tapahanzo that is with us at the moment, making her voice raised and known. Now, this is that wonderful time now where we're going to get uh, each of you, if you want to, to uh, start your video. Um, and if you've got any questions or you just want to say hi, uh, now is the time. Well, people are figuring out where their videos and where their microphones are on Zoom. I just want to give a shout out from our wonderful social media end. We had Christine Powers on, Annette Amara from Texas, Christina Bueno uh, from New York, Marcelina Martin, who was on, Vox Femme, who are in Antonio, San Antonio in Texas. Uh, they made a comment saying, we love listening to Lucy Tapahanzo, so rich. So with that, Tash, I'm going to flick that over to you. All right. So uh, absolutely. Uh, thank you. 
let's uh let's hear from uh Rachel Pablo. How you doing, sister? I a I a lum. Um yat a um um Miss Tabahanzo. Um I just wanted to say hello and thank you for sharing and it was wonderful to hear the wise words that you shared and um I I just wanted to say hi. Oh yeah. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rachel. It's so great to see you. Before you say anything else, Tash, I'd also like to acknowledge Dr. Robert Martin, who <laughs> is not only the president of the Institute of American Indian Art, but he is also the beloved wife of Lucy Tapahanto. Thank you so much for being here. And you two are a power couple with all that you do. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> yep, that's my guy right there. <laughs> what a, thank you. Thank you very much. It's nice seeing you, Rochelle. <laughs> all right, let's go on over to uh, Michelle Redman, uh, lawyer for the Navajo Nation, is with us tonight. Uh, president of uh, Indigenous Ways as well. Thank you for being with yeah. us, Michelle. Yeah, um, I'm so I'm so happy to hear your 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 discussion and all the the th the things that it brought up in me from the cultural aspect and and the, the touching feelings that I felt listening to your poetry was just oh, mm -hmm. it was so it was so heartfelt and I could I could visualize everything that you were saying in your poetry whether it was in English or Navajo because. You're very descriptive in the way you you do your poetry, even with even with the, the English language, you know. And um, so I was very touched by that, and it it brought memories back of being up at my grandma's sheep camp and and the coffee. <laughs> and for us, we're as the Folgers. That's the good one. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so we just really loved the Folgers and uh, but just all the all the things that we did together, do together um, as a family, <clears throat> that it's mm -hmm. it's very meaningful and it really uh, binds us and brings us so much closer. And my daughter had a laughing ceremony when she mm -hmm. had her first her first belly laugh from the bottom of her stomach. And then she had the kinesta when she came when that came time for her moon cycle. And mm -hmm. and each time there was always lots of family that were involved that came and participated and 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 nurtured her and loved her and let her know that they were supportive of her her mm -hmm. her 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 walk on this earth and that you know they wanted her to be happy and they wanted her to have a good journey so mm -hmm. i really believe in the ceremonies and our way of life and the way that we do things is is very precious and um, it is and i, I love the way you Mm -hmm. Yeah, I one love the thing, way you just. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say one thing that I I I didn't mention, but I think was alluded to, was that when we have these ceremonies, like the first laugh in the Kinalta, um, the person um, that we're having it for is embodies a holy person. They become changing woman. So. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons well, not only do we go to these ceremonies because we love, you know, we love uh, the family member, but we are also blessed too. In return, they bless us. So that's yes. like, yeah, you don't have that chance often to encounter a holy person, but that's who our family members are. During the babies are our, our um, white shell girl or changing woman. Um, or, or the Kinal Dao is changing woman. That's why we run behind her so we can mm. get her blessings. So that's really part of it too. Thank you so much. Okay. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you. Such a pleasure. Such a pleasure. Thanks. Okay, we got a quick word from Sue. Sue, would you like to say hi from New Hampshire? Hi, thank you. Um, I just want to thank you so much for sharing this evening. I feel like you took me home. Oh. It used to be to your family mm. and your culture and and your way of thinking and how words how words put together and selected 
reflect so much more than what the dictionary says. So That's thank you. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for translating. Mm. <laughs> and uh, Velma Hale. Hello, Velma. Would you like to say something? Oh. Um, I'm a, a professor here at the Net College with the English Division. I'm also the School of Arts Humanities Chair for that division. And so it's nice to see your presentation and then also bring in that indigenous uh, sovereignty to reclaim mm -hmm. it through language. <laughs> and then we uh -oh. do need that perspective from that um, both epistemologies because a lot of our young students want to know the clarification why a certain oh. you bring in the English part. And I think that's something we need to uh, make uh, learning relevant for our student. And that's the same thing with science too. Just like what you're talking about, the Hasado we mm -hmm. have our own perspective of Navajo science, but it was never acknowledged as that. But when you come to study both worlds, then you become to revalidate that there is that sovereignty. It was there all along. So, mm -hmm. but thank you for bringing out your work, Kehat and Jonia. Oh, I think it's really important to to think about these things because it really makes you stronger. You just feel out, like, you know, I'm, I really am the person that um, my parents hope I would be. <laughs> you just feel really strong and just, it really strengthens and it comforts you. You just feel like you can do whatever you want. Yeah. That's the way I feel yeah. about it. <laughs> Well, if you uh -huh. see uh, Velma Hale, if you see Paul Waletto, tell him Tasha said, hi, I was one of his students at Dene College when it was Navajo Community College. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, how was she? Uh, what is she? Huh? I think his wife is on the on our um, view here, Karen Waletto. Oh. I Karen saw Karen. Yeah. yeah. Oh my Paul gosh. Paul is my Karen. little brother. <laughs> oh, I love Paul. I still remember him from when I was just a young, I was a teenager actually when I was in his class. I wrote a play. I Ooh. still remember that play. It was called uh, um, The Impossible. <laughs> that was a long time ago. Produced. Yeah. Anyways. Um, also, thank you everyone for beaming in live, whether you're on social media or here on Zoom. A big shout out to our interpreters, um, Mariah always, and always, also always. Chris Esiano. We'll look forward to seeing each and every one of you here November 15, same time, same channel, with the wonderful Jean Brave Rock. But least of all, let's please give it up. For the one and only extraordinary being Lucy Tapahanzo. <laughs> That's a poem in itself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Touch the earth. Yeah.